In this video, we're going to look at the Java EE platform architecture. And specifically, we're going to look at this diagram, which comes from a really great book called the Java EE 7 Big Picture by Oracle Press by Danny Coward, Dr. Danny Coward. And this is on page 31, but we're going to take a look at it piece by piece. So let's get started. So the first thing is that remember in your in the Java application and Java EE, which remember stands for the Java Enterprise Edition, you get some additional features, components that you don't get in regular Java. And they're, you know, unsurprisingly very useful for developing enterprise level applications. So what do I mean by that? Well, imagine that if you're not using EE, you're not EE, you're not using the Enterprise Edition. In regular Java, if this is your code, you're going to have to do some additional work and sometimes quite a bit of work to do some things that in an enterprise you, you want to work right out of the box. So for example, let's say that you've got you know two servers out here and this is running your LDAP system. So you know Active Directory, for example, most likely in, in a lot of cases, but it may not be. It could be IBM's secure directory server. And in any case, <clears throat> and actually you could have both of these, and that does in fact happen. In, if you have some users here, say external users, and here you have some internal users, but you've got one system that your customers are trying to connect to, and you want to authenticate via here or via here, if you're doing that in regular Java, that can be very, very um, messy. Not only to create, but then also potentially to maintain. So if you change things though, and you use the enterprise edition of Java, and specifically use a Java EE server, namely WAS, WebSphere Application Server, now things change because the WebSphere Application Server can federate these two out. And this isn't really a, a video about federation, this is just to show you that by using Java EE, and specifically WAS or Java EE, uh, Java EE server, you get something called containers. And it's really the container that allows you to do these really advanced, really nice time-saving things like federate out your security. And that's really just one thing that a, a container will let you do. Now, let's focus a little bit more on some of these components that in fact these containers belong to and and the other pieces we saw previously in that diagram so in the diagram you'll see that the whole java ee system is sort of shown like this in a big box there are two sub container in fact i'm going to make this slightly smaller and i'll see why in a little bit there are two major containers the first one is what's called the web container. And by the way, a container is really just a way to abstract things out so that you as a Java programmer, your team of Java programmers don't have to deal with these nitty gritty things that you know that you'd have to normally do in regular old Java. So that is the first of the two containers, the web containers. And then separately, there's a container called an EJB container. Now, most of the application logic that is going to be created will be created here in the EJB container. So this is really your application logic. It's your business logic. In the three core setup, you know, where you have uh, your front end and the back end, and then in, you have this middle, this is the three tier or in tier system we talked about before. This right here, is the middle tier and then the front end is here and then if we're going to draw the back end which is your database that would be out here now and we're going to come back to this idea in a few in a few minutes however this is these are the basics now the thing about the containers is that the web container which is really what your client is going to connect to is going to connect into something called a servlet in most cases. And it's the servlet that will connect out to 
that will delegate off to the EJB container. So in other words, this, the flow of this essentially goes like this. Your, your client, your browser, will go into the web container, into the servlet. The servlet is a, basically and very often going to output a web page like this for the client, obviously, for here in the, in the browsers. Let's, let's draw it there. It would look like this. But the question is, where is it going to get the data from? Well, one of the things is it could go out to a database. I'm going to move this over. It could go out to a database and grab that, and it would do something like this. This is going to happen through something called a persist. It, there's many ways this can happen, but one of these is called the persistence component, and then go out to the database. And then that could either read or write, and come back, and then go into the web log the, to the, to the application logic portion, and then back into the servlet, which will then present that data as a web page. So that's a typical sort of flow. Now, so these, this is the idea of a container, but there's also something called a component. These are comp this is a component. The servlet is a com web container component, but there are many other kinds of components that could go in here and also that can go uh, in here. The most important component, web container component, is the servlet. The most important e uh, con sorry, yeah, the most yes, the most important EJB uh, container component is of course an EJB. Now an EJB is an enterprise Java bean. Now if you're not using an enterprise edition, then that's just a Java bean. And Java beans are known as POJOs, or plain old Java objects. So if your developer is writing something, then he's writing Java objects, and that's basically a POJO, and that is a Java bean. But in the enterprise world, you get these additional advanced features like we had been talking about, where you can do this persistence piece to get into a database quickly and easily, where you don't really need to know much, if anything, about the database here. And also you get you can go through security, uh, a security component, right? So in our earlier example of getting into your multiple uh, multiple LDAP directories, so you had Active Directory here, SDS here, you can do that through the security component. These would let you do both of those things. And this is really the advantage of the container-based system is that it abstracts away for your for your Java developers all of the nitty-gritty involved of how does you know how do I write Java to get into Active Directory? How, how am I going to do that? Well, you don't need to know how to do that if you use this abstraction layer. And then lastly, uh, you can you have a Java client out here, not a web client, but a Java client, and it's the Java client that could do essentially what what we were doing before with the persistence layer. So the Java client can come into the persistence layer and go into your database as well. So this is kind of the overall flow, and it's an attempt, really, my attempt, to show you how all these pieces fit together. Now, before I end this video, I want to show you on page 38 this, and don't worry, you don't need to be a programmer to understand this piece of the video, but you will see that uh, if you this is, let me show you, this is the model EJB, uh, a portion of the code that they use as a kind of hello world example. Notice here that you have this at, at symbol that says stateful, and you have another one that says at persistence unit. What that means is something that's maybe not, it's not very obvious, but it's very powerful. Imagine that, you don't even have to imagine this because you already, you're already used to this. Remember that Web3 application server already has uh, web interface and when you use these at you being the application developer when you use these at symbols you can you as the administrator can go in here and provide a value through the web server application server that will then get transferred into the code of whatever program that you're running through these at symbols. Th this is what's known as injection. And specifically, it's called dependency injection because the whole Java EE application is dependent on the EE platform, which itself 
is has these uh, dependencies on the container and the EJ the web container and the EJB container. So this is very interesting because it allows you as an administrator to affect the code that's running inside of your application. As you can see this uh, here, right, the stateful annotation declares this class as a particular kind of enterprise bean, a stateful session bean. This means that the enterprise bean container will run this enterprise bean, will create one instance of the bean for each client that it talks to. So this is very, very interesting and very powerful stuff. And you can see it here on page 41, where you will not find any code in this application that ever initializes this instance variable. This just means a variable, and they mean EMF. Never Initialization means an equal sign, and they put some value in it. That doesn't happen in the code because Java EE containers can initialize certain variables while the component is coming to life, provided they are specially marked with Java annotations. In this case, the persistence unit annotation. This process is called injection, and it's a pattern and a technique that you will see used in many places in the Java EE platform.